So if you wanted to make action figures out of people in the Bible, obviously the first one to make is Jesus, because that's always the right answer. But uh, after that, if you had to pick who you would make an action figure out of, Paul would be one of the first people you would do. Paul was indeed a man of action. As a young Jewish man, it wasn't enough for him just to be annoyed that there were these weird Jewish followers of Jesus. He wanted to do something about it. So he went out and started to involve in the persecutions of Christians and helped with the stoning of Stephen. When uh, he was done with that, he wasn't just going to sit there in that city and be happy that he cleaned up that city. He got his paperwork in order and he was on his way to the next town so he could deal with the problems over there. After uh, Jesus and him had a little chat, Paul saw the error of his ways. He did not go to the closest church and settle down to teach Sunday school and kind of just have a little tent making business. No, he went, he started traveling and he went from town to town to town, uh, starting churches, getting involved in the community. And, and to start a church would take months, if not years, every time. He spent decades of his love, life going and doing an active fellow, if ever there was one. When he heard that there was a famine in Jerusalem, he did not say, well, that's a shame. I'm already busy enough. He said, we have to do something about this. He took action. He started gathering people together to put together supplies to relieve the famine in Jerusalem. Paul was indeed a man of action. And so when the church at Colossae receives this letter from Paul, there's the opening sentence we talked about last week, grace to you and peace. It helps everyone get on the same page that Paul really wants what's best for them. And what do you expect Paul, the guy who's always doing something, to say next? You, know, you expect him to say, okay, here's what you do. I'm, I'm a guy who does a lot of things. Here's what you should do. That's what they're probably expecting. I invite you to turn to Colossians 1, and we're going to have a, sort of a weird cross between a Bible study and a sermon today, because we need to look at this. So if you have a Bible handy, turn to Colossians 1. We pay attention to what Paul has to say. What Paul starts out is, he says, as we are praying, we give thanks. Now, as you look at what he actually is praying for, is he praying giving thanks to the church because they've been working so hard? Is he praying giving thanks to the leadership because it's been pouring itself out? No, what he's giving thanks to at the beginning is he says, I give thanks to God. I give thanks to God, thanking God for the faith and for the loving of the saints they have had. That's what Paul is thankful for. At the very beginning, he's not thankful for them. He is thankful for what God is doing. Colossians 1.3. But it, that's rooted in something greater. What makes it possible for, for what they are doing, uh, it, it re continues on. We are thankful for the hope laid up for you in heaven, for the kingdom of God to come. Depending on your translation, it, it goes a little bit differently. The message translates it as, The lines of purpose in your lives never grow slack tightly tied as they are to your future in heaven, kept taught by hope. In everything you're doing, what's being laid out here by Paul, in everything you're doing, it is being done as you are pulled toward the future, which has already been determined by God our Father. You are being kept taught by the hope of what of the future that is to come, as we are pulled in the fulfillment of the hope of the time and place when Jesus will reign fully. Right. Verse 6, we see that Paul is now talking about bearing fruit. He's thankful for the, the, the fruit that is being born. But if you look at what is, what is bearing fruit, right? what is actually doing the bearing there? Is it the people that are bearing the fruit? No. The thing that is bearing the fruit, again, is the gospel that is bearing the fruit. They are the fruit. They are the, the receiving end of the gospel. The gospel is the one that is actually doing the doing. Right? Verse 7, the bearing fruit from something they were taught that they had received from Epiphras who uh, Paul had trained. And so if you look at these first verses, if you pay attention to the verb tense, like if you pay attention to who is doing the action here, Paul, the man of action, is using all passive verbs. Right? 
per, it is not the church at Colossae that is doing what is going on here. It is God. It's not something immediately obvious as you start reading this. At, at least it wasn't to me. Uh, maybe you are better at reading scripture than I am. But it, I, I plowed through that and it took me a few times to notice. God is the one who is doing things as we read this first part of Colossians. It, it continues in verse 9. We continue to pray for you that you might be filled. Again, who is who's doing the thing here? They're not doing anything. They're being filled. Right? We pray that you might be filled. That you might be filled with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So that, in verse 10, you might walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit, increasing in knowledge of God, strengthened to patiently and steadfast seek God and seek God's will. Right? And it starts to sound like, like strengthened so that you can do something, but before he gets, talks about doing for something for too long, he goes right back to, and don't forget, it's God who qualified you to do this at all. Right? You are qualified to do this at all. The only reason you can do this is because what God has done first. Paul so is talking about what they might do, but it is only made possible because what God has done. Getting back to that, back to that passive voice. This whole first part of the chapter is an extensive discussion of receiving, of accepting. It is not the church that is doing. It is the church that is the place that people are receiving what God is doing. God is the one who is taking the action here. Right, that, that's up through verse 12. And then in, if you look at verse 13, we have one of the first active verbs of, of this, this passage. This active, for he, God, for God delivered us. Right, now we're active verse, right? active tense verbs. For God delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here it is. Now we're starting to get some action. But the action is not, again, by us. It's by God. God. God is the one who's doing the delivering. This active voice continues as we hear Paul launch into something that feels like a refrain that everyone knows. If you think of the way that we are taught, there are certain refrains that come to mind. Like if, if I want to teach you about the faith, I'm going to, we'll, we'll probably use the Apostles' Creed. And so if I, believe, if I say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Exactly, right? We, are, we learn by what we repeat, what we internalize. If I want to teach you what, what is so amazing about grace, we're going to sing, Amazing grace, how, how sweet the sound that... Exactly, right? That's what this is to the church at Colossae. Paul starts writing something, and they, they, ah, they know this. They're saying it along as they're hearing this, as they hear this common statement that Paul had used to, to teach them, uh, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Right, this is something that they have known. This is actually a... If you start looking up this passage online, people studying it, this is the passage that describes what's called the cosmic Christ. Because it's trying to, the idea that this is the, this is the passage that gives you the, the most full and concise description of everything that Jesus is. Like this is an amazing compaction of, of all things are made by him and for him and in him all things hold together. You want to know who Christ is? Here's the passage. So he Paul starts telling them this again. They go, ah, we know this. Right? And so the person who is doing the doing here in this passage, the one who's actually doing things, is the image of the invisible God. If you go back 
to Moses. When, when Moses is chilling with a bush on fire, and Moses is about to go off and confront Pharaoh and say, let my people go, he says to this, to God, burning bush, he says, if they ask, what is your name? What should, we say? What should I say? And, and God says to him, my name is, you can call my name Yahweh. And Yahweh is a verb. It's not a noun, it's a verb, right? And so the verb is uh, the uh, being and doing verb. And so it, it can be translated a whole bunch of different ways, and it can be translated all of them at the same time. So it's intentionally ambiguous. And because Yahweh can mean, I am what I am. It can mean, I am what I have done. It can mean, I am what I will do, all at the same time. And so if you say, my name is Yahweh, it's like saying, my name is, well, pay attention to what I'm doing. If you want to know who I am, look at what I've done, look at what I'm doing right now, and pay attention to what's next. And so for Jesus to be the image of the invisible God is the fulfillment of this, right? If you want to know who God is, you look at God, what God has done, is doing, and will do. And if you want to know what God is doing, you look at Jesus. This is as close as you're going to get to knowing God. You look at Jesus, and that's how you know who God is. He is the image of the invisible God. You can't see him, but you can see Jesus, and that's how you're going to know. That's how you're going to understand Yahweh. I am, I am what I am doing. And then we read on, uh, Jesus is the one, all things have been created by him and for him. And that's a big phrase. All things created by him and for him, by him, gets, start, implies that anything you look at and you say, wow, that's beautiful. Why is it beautiful? It's beautiful because it reflects the beauty of the one who made it. If you look at anything and say, man, that's good looking, that's beautiful, that's graceful, that's wonderful, that's majestic, it is beautiful and majestic and amazing because it reflects the beauty and majesty of Jesus who ever made everything. So everything is made by him and for him. And the for him, that, whew, why do things exist? What is, why do things, why does the church exist? It exists, the church exists for Jesus. It is the place that we gather to do what Jesus wants, right? What is the purpose of family? Well, it is made by Jesus and for Jesus. Family is designed to reflect the family of, of Jesus that we see, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the way that they are intermingled and, and, and they are three people, they are so tightly bound together. Family is meant to be for Jesus, so we begin to practice that ourselves. Right? What is the purpose of work? Why do we have work? Work is for Jesus. Jesus was a carpenter. He molded creation to, to, for, for a purpose, for God's purpose. And, and we, our work is designed to do the same, to create what is beautiful and true. It is for Jesus. What, what, is, why does, what is the purpose of music? Why do we have music? Music is it's actually, if you look at old manuscripts of music, Bach, Handel, etc., they sign their music at the end, Soli Dei Gloria. For, for the glory of God. Like music for centuries has been understood to be for God, for, for Jesus. And so everything that is exists for Jesus. And we read on in Colossians 1, 21 and 22. Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly blood through death in order to present you before him wholly and blameless and beyond reproach. This is the point in which I tell you to grab a pen or pencil and circle the word you. Like seriously, if you have a, your Bible open, grab a pencil and circle the word you there. And write y'all. Or if you want to be really hick, you can say Ewins. Anyone here say Ewins? You, have you heard Ewins before? Yeah, I can't quite say it with a straight face. I can say y'all, though. You in the Bible is almost always plural. Right? And so when it talks about how although you, it's not like you specifically, it's although y'all were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled y'all through death in order to present y'all before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Y'all were fallen and y'all have been saved. 
That, that's the logic of how Jesus works. We're always in this together. And for a church that has, is arguing and fighting to hear that y'all are being saved together, and there's no such thing as individual salvation. Y'all are being saved together because Jesus died for you and y'all, all y'all, if you want to be really emphatic about it. All right. So whenever you see you in the Bible, check your, uh, the footnotes and see it's probably plural. And now we come to if. Isn't if a powerful word? Like, thus far we've said, like, receive what God is offering you. Like, receive, and then that God is doing all these amazing things, and you are be all y'all are being saved, and here we hit the word if. And it would have caught people up short. Like, everything is going great if... This is verse 23. If, it's, it's going to grow great, if you continue in the faith established and steadfast and do not move away from the gospel you have heard. Right? This is a huge if. Right? The structure here, the first part of the, this chapter, receive all the good things that God is giving you. The, the passive tense, we are receiving what God is doing. And, and then God is the one who is active. And God is the one who has made all things for him and f through him and for him. And if you keep that straight, your salvation is in good shape. But you've got to keep that straight. First you receive what God is the one who is doing. I have two thoughts about this. First, we read this closely, and sometimes you've got to read Scripture real slow to notice these details, or else you just glide right past them, right? We read this closely, we understand that faith is first passive. Faith is something done for us, and then we react. And we're in a culture that likes action. Like, it, we, you ever heard of a reaction hero? Yeah, he was really good after the fact. Like, we don't talk about reaction. Action heroes, not reaction heroes. We want action heroes. And the nature of the faith is to say, first you receive, and then we react. And this is a challenge for me, for us. I I'm preaching to me. You happen to be in the room. Because I find myself saying things, maybe you're better than this, I find myself saying things like, I have, too much thing, I have too much to do today to stop in the morning to pray and to write and to read. I'm just too busy, right? And then what happens if I go off and do that? I'm too busy and I go off and I'm busy, 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 and I'm just floundering. I can flounder all day and look at all the things I've gotten done, but it's not that I'm too busy not to pray. Often it's I'm too busy let me get this right. I'm, I think I'm too busy to pray, and what the reality is, I'm too busy not to pray. Like, there are so many things pressing on your time, there are so many things pressing on my time, that I am too busy not to pray, because if I don't stop and receive, then I don't react to what God is doing. Instead, I'm just going off and doing my own thing all day. And, and it, it is a challenge for me to stop and receive what is offered in worship, to stop and receive what is offered in prayer, to stop and receive the wisdom of Scripture, to stop and receive the assurance of the Spirit that I am following Jesus, and to spend the time to stop and receive is always a challenge for me. Always. I'm 38. You'd think it would gotten better by now. I've been a pastor for 12 years. Has it gotten easier? No. It has not gotten any easier to spend the time in the morning to stop and receive. I'll get it right one day. I hope we all can practice this together. <laughs> and always feel free to ask me, Andy, did you stop and pray this morning? I, I hope I can always tell you yes. The second thing that comes to mind as I'm thinking, as I'm reading through this, is... Um, I flew recently to Florida, and, and you know what happens when you fly? You have to leave behind all your tools, because I always carry a flashlight, and then I have my uh, pens, and then I have my, uh, let's see, harder to get in my pocket with this on. I have a, carry a Leatherman, and then I have a knife, and, uh, and my keys. And I can't take half of that with me. And so I found myself in Disney World, which was uh, such a shame, right? Hard, hard, hard for you, Andy. But I found myself in Disney World, and my son bought a train, which is no surprise, three-year-old, he bought a train. And um, 
you know what happens when you open a train up? Well, first, my son hands it to me, and, and I, ha I don't have my knife on me, so I can't just cut it open. I'm struggling, and my son's not used to this, waiting for his train. And so I'm struggling to open it up, and I get it up, open, and you, it's attached. And anyone who's opened a toy in the last decade knows what's happening here, right? They have that piece of plastic with a screw through it, and it's up in it. Exactly. And what do you have to have if you're going to open up that? you got to have, uh, i got to have my Leatherman. i got to have my tool. I don't have... So here's what I have. This is what I have bought so that I can have something on me when I fly. It's called a Gerber Shard. And it is appropriately named because it is indeed just one chip off of a real tool. It is effectively useless because every time you turn it one half rotation, you have to let go, reset it, grab it, and turn it again. This is the wrong tool for any job. It is... And mostly I carry it just to make myself feel better that I could actually do something. It's pathetic. And... Um, Thinking about the wrong tool for the job, there's nothing more annoying, there, there probably are more annoying things, but there are very few things more annoying than having the wrong tool for the job, right? And, and thinking about how Paul lays this out, it reminds me of that feeling of having the wrong tool for the job. Let me explain. The logic of this passage, if you outline the passage, I always encourage people to outline scripture so you can understand the logic of the passage. The logic of the passage is we receive so that we can do, fulfill because we are made for Jesus. So the tool is we receive what God gives us so, so we can do the job, which is to do what is for Jesus. And so right tool, right job. Now, there are various permutations of it. There, there's the wrong tool. Let's say you have the wrong tool. The wrong tool in this situation is you try to do it yourself. You're not going to receive what God does. You're going to say, I'm going to do this all myself because I'm in control. I'm empowered. I can do it all myself. And if you have the wrong tool for the right job, you're going to, do, you're going to live for Jesus. Are we capable of doing by ourselves what is needed to make Jesus happy? This is called works righteousness. It doesn't work. We will end up frustrated because we are not good enough to do it by ourselves. We need what Jesus offers. So that's the wrong tool for the right job. Then there is the right tool. I'm going to receive what God offers for the wrong job. And I'm not going to do it for Jesus. I'm going to do it for myself because I want what I want. And this is otherwise known as the prosperity gospel. If I'm going to receive what God offers so I can get what I want, this is otherwise known as Joel Osteen. Because what's Joel Osteen's very famous book? Your best life now. Let me tell you something about your best life now. If your life is yours, it's not going to go very far. Your life was not made for you. Your life was made for Jesus, right? If you try to live your best life now, and it's all about you, it ain't going to work. Because if you receive what God gives you, what God has given you is not going to be what you want. Because what I want is about me. And God has this funny habit of showing up with his friends and wanting us to go out there and serve someone else. So that would be right tool, receive what God offers, wrong job, about, all about you. Then there is wrong tool, I'm going to do it all myself for the wrong job, which is I'm going to do it all myself for me. And that ends up being practical atheism, because I can say Jesus all day long, but if I don't take the time to receive what God offers and then live my life for Jesus, I'm not, that's just, it's practical atheism. And so the, the, the right, what Paul is demonstrating here is the right tool, receive what God has to offer so that we can do the right job, so we can live for Jesus. For all things were created by him and for him. That, that's the right combination here. Right job, right tool. Receive what God has to offer. Take the time to receive what God offers so that we might do what Jesus desires. And that is setting, Paul is setting up the church at Colossae to be able to understand and what he's going to talk about next, and we'll get to next week. But I, as I read and reread this, what I join Paul in is giving thanks for all that God has done in and for you. And I pray that having received what God offers, that you might use it for what God desires. Because I confess, you know, those permutations, right job, wrong job, right tool, right tool, I have lived all four of those at different times. I realize there are times when I'm trying to do it all of myself, and I have to, to, to 
ah, I have to smack myself around. No, stop and go receive. And I'll, I realize I'm focusing on what I want now, what God wants. Like, I have lived each of those options. Right? It is my prayer that each of us, might, as we come to worship, we might be reminded that the logic of this is we receive what God offers so that we might live for Jesus, the one who made, who everything was made by him and for him. Amen. I invite you to stand.